Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, this is... Uh, I, I Somehow I feel like things are falling back into normal cadence. Here it is, mid-July. It's hot. And uh, there's, a, there's a feeling about the city, you know, like it's a gigantic cake of yeast. I, I dig New York in midsummer. I really do. You can park your car. And, uh, well, that is, unless it gets towed away. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, the usual New York fetching. It's New York. It's the summertime. Dangerous time of the year, I tell you. Did you hear about the guy the other day in San Francisco? It's, it's a nutty time. You know, it's a, what makes it so great this summer? I mean, it's stuff like this doesn't happen. Here, here's a note here from San Francisco. Stuff like this doesn't happen in the winter. Egon J. Fever, which for starters is pretty good right there, you know. Egon J. Fever. I guess he only exists on hot days in the summer. He doesn't, <laughs> with a name like that, you know. Egon J. Fever took his brand new sledgehammer and smashed out 19 huge plate glass windows in a downtown bank in San Francisco, one after the other. Just walked around and popped in windows. And, quote, it was either this or I'm going to get a rifle and go up on top of the roof and shoot at peoples. Fever, 29, told the arresting officers a cheering crowd gathered to watch Fever, shattering the 15-foot windows worth $1,700 each. As Fever was poised to smash window number 20, Patrolman Vincent Hurley ran up, shotgun in hand, and ordered him to halt. The crowd booed. <laughs> summer, you see. It's summer. Yeah, I, I'm going to warn you, you got to be careful of summertime because more fantastic mistakes have been made in the summer that have affected man's life forever than any other single time of the year. That's right. And in all kinds of ways. I wonder how many guys, right this minute, this instant, on this hot July night, are preparing to do something that could affect them for, well, the rest of their life. Just about this time of the night, you're hurtling through the darkness and Route 3, the heat. You know those heat waves rising off the Reynolds Wrap hood of your Pontiac? You go past the uh, Tick-Tock Diner, Route 46. There's this chick sitting next to you. God knows what's going to happen tonight. You know, little Thunderbird Chianti. What's the price? 30 twice. What's the game? Yeah, well, the game is what you're going to make it. It's the heat. The heat will do it to you every time. You know, in fact, uh, there's some evidence to prove that some of the worst decisions in history have been made in hot weather just because of the passions that flow rich and deep during this time of the year and do not flow at any other time of the year. Hitler, for example, decided to attack England with his Luftwaffe in July. Well, we know what happened to that one. Terrible decision. He decided to attack Russia, you know, in the middle of July, too. Sitting there, you know, with the guys down at the beer hall, down at the brow house. Everything seemed possible. Everything seemed possible. And some of the great moments of my life have occurred in hot weather, just like this. I feel the beating pulse of fugitive angers, the faint wisp of salty, acrid passions, hot, the heat of the city, very different from the heat of the country, you'll concede, Larry, that'd be different, and almost anything is capable to a guy living in a room and a half temperature all through the summer, 115 degrees. I'm going to tell you about the time I was living in this hotel in Toledo one summer. And uh, I got it, uh, this room, $2 and a half cheaper than any other room on the floor because there was no air conditioning. So I'd give it to you cheaper for two, two bucks and a half less due to the fact there's no air conditioning. Little did I realize at the time that I signed up for that what hell I was buying for two dollars and a half. 
although two dollars and a half was crucial at the time. Since I was, I was so tight, I was squeaking so hard that summer, with that rotten, stinking, miserable job that I had. I was going to school at the time. I got this really lousy job through an ad. You ever got a job through an ad? Did you? I'll tell you. Every time I go down the subway and I see that big sign says I got my job through the New York Times, I'm like, ha, 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 God, yeah. <laughs> I laugh. Because I remember that summer, that stinking hot summer on the shores of Lake Erie. And I had uh, made the classic mistake of going for the short buck. I said, okay, I'll take the room. I'm laying in this room one night, my hot room in Toledo. In fact, it, it was so hot, temperature averaged, I'd say 115 in the room. And I did not realize at the time that one of the other reasons why I got this room for two dollars and a half cheaper was because this room was over the hot water boiler, which uh, provides right. It was, it was on the second floor. See, I, it was way in the back of the hotel there, and uh, I got the room for two dollars and a half cheaper. And it seemed kind of nice in the early part of June, but by the middle of July, every night when I would enter that room, I, I remember I would open the door. See. Have you ever opened the door to an oven set on medium broil? And uh, it's been, you know, it's been warming up for, you know, a half an hour, and you're going to put a steak in it or something. And I just opened up. It was amazing. That room was hot, but when every, everything else in town was cold. And it was the reverse when it was cold out. And, uh, you know, so I would, open, I would open this door, and I'd just feel the heat just roll out. Just one great, turgid roll. And I'd hold the door open, see, and let the heat roll out down the hall like a great big ball of some kind of fuzzy, soft, viscous material. It would just roll out. Have you ever seen the heat in a room so, so, so palpably real that you could see faint fur growing on it? You could run up against it and bounce against it, and it's rebound, sort of a squishy, soft feel. And the heat would roll out. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> And I used to lie there. My this 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 bed, interesting. They had a mattress that was stuffed with old Toledo Blade editorial pages. Interesting mattress. Mattress. It had I thought you know looked rolling around. It had like doorknobs in it and stuff. It's funny, but it get it got you in shape. You know, it was great. kept your kept your mind moving, always roving, laying in the sack there late at night in Toledo, smelling Lake Erie. I don't know. You, you've all smelled Jersey, haven't you, when the wind is right? That great human compost heap across the river there. I don't think it's any particular thing you smell when you smell Jersey. You just smell the combined passions of it all. Jersey's a very passionate state. Hoboken. You ever been in Hoboken? My God, 374 bars and one 17-foot stretch of street. And all of them roaring at once, going constantly. You just smell it. You smell the human life. The, the, it's Vita. Vita. Life. Vita. It's the Latin. The life force roaring out across the river here. And I'm laying in the sack there in Toledo. And I'm smelling Lake Erie. Which, incidentally, is much more fragrant. You would be surprised. Much more fragrant than Jersey. Heavy, rich fragrant. Millions of dead and decaying bullheads. God knows what else is in the lake there. Fitful breeze blowing along Huron Street. Temperature 105, and I have come back to my room with a sack of White Castle hamburgers. Well, a sack, that's kind of exaggerating a little bit because after all it was uh, it was the day after payday so I was broke naturally and I had uh, maybe two hamburgers in a sack and a glass of tepid orange drink Have you ever sat in a hotel room in a town you don't know <laughs> and stared out of a grimy window at the rooftops of existence and drank White Castle orange drink Eating White Castle hamburgers, I lay on a the sack there. Heat is growing richer and riper. 
and I hear people talking in the next room. Some night when radio's really grown up, people are truly, truly adult. I will tell you some of the great fugitive conversations I've heard through cheap hotel rooms of my time, recorded through, you know, for all existence. Yes, this is WOR New York, an RKO general station, so you know who to get mad at. Someday you'll own. Someday you'll own. Someday you'll own. It's inevitable, friends. Sooner or later, you'll own generals. Run up to. Yeah, you might as well give in. You can't fight the inevitable, friends. So whether you drive a sports car, sedan, an Irish mail, a bicycle, compact, or limousine, General Tire has the tires you need at prices you can afford. Even old you, steel-belted radial tires. Oh, no, they ever beautiful. Wide, raised, white letter tires. You have all kinds of wild stuff saying all over them. General's exacting standards. In the Bronx, you can see Murray Lester at 579 Grand Concourse. The Bronx General Tire. Sooner or later, yeah, your own generals. Ba-dum-bum. Yeah, yeah. Sooner or later, your own generals. Ba-dum-bum. Oh, you want to hear what happened in the hotel room, don't you, in Toledo? Well, I did have a fantastic experience in that hotel room. Uh, every time it gets hot like this, I think about that because, uh, especially when I smell, you know, during the summertime, sometimes there's a very soft, uh, just a puff of furnace-like wind breeze, and you smell the faint edge of, of uh, all kinds of things, and it's hard to pinpoint those smells you get in the summertime. Because they are the smell of life itself, the force of existence. You know, I really do think that there's two kinds of people in that, in that uh, very primal, very primitive level. There are people who just taste life all the time. They know they're alive. And they dig the aliveness of being alive, you know. And then there's the others who just have no consciousness, really, of being alive. They have consciousness of doing things. You know, do, getting, a, getting a camper. God, you know, I'll tell you, this camper thing is getting to be an epidemic. If I, you know, every time I get a camper ahead of me when I'm driving along, I want to sneak up and pull the plug on their plumbing. You know, <laughs> I don't know what it is about campers. I just... <laughs> They, 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 there's something about campers they're just, just moving around ahead of me, just, it's, uh, just to see them, that, uh, that bug me. What is it? Why, why do I get angry? Why do campers make me mad? Yeah. I'm, you know, just, 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 just personal. Maybe it stems from, you know, each of us live very private lives. There's no way for you to know anything about my life any more than there is any way for me to know anything about yours. And you can live with a person for 500 years and still have a totally private life and do. And what's going on in that raging inferno in your mind? Those constantly shifting, vague, hazy codachromes of, of half-seen insights. Nothing to do with anybody else but you. So I'm laying in my sack one night in Toledo in the middle of July, just like this. The temperature's 115 degrees outside which meant inside it was not measured, measurable by ordinary non-scientific instruments. And I could hear the boiler down below the floor gurgling and bubbling. See, I know what it's like to live in close proximity to hell. I mean, really hell. I tell you, I spent one summer working in, in, uh, in the 40-inch soaking pit in the steel mill where the temperatures that we've had the last couple of days here in the eastern seaboard, were a brisk, spanking December breeze. I'm serious about it. Have you noticed? Uh, have you noticed on this side of my face? You notice carefully, Larry, that uh, I've had a very, a permanent, vague suntan. You have noticed that about me? I'm different. One one side of me is different color than the other side. I was. That's from that summer of the forty and soaking pits. And I used to I used to mainline salt tablets. We'd 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 stand around the uh, water cooler and just pop salt tablets, you know, like four or five kids 
over in the South Bronx popping their pills, you know, just standing there popping those salt tablets. And, uh, you know, you, you eat enough salt tablets, you stand in enough heat, and you drink enough water, and it, it forms a, a, like a, almost like a, like an ancient swamp down in your gut. And then you, you, uh, you have, uh, your lunch, you know, after about maybe a half a pound of salt tablets and about 17 gallons of, uh, this special salt iodide water that they give you in steel mills, you know, there's special water they drink in there. It tastes like, what it tastes like is, uh, D, it tastes like gelded Listerine. Yeah. You imagine, then you know, it's a, Strange taste. Guys used to gargle with it once in a while. They're good for thinning paint and stuff. And guys that would would drink this water, see, out of desperation, you had to drink something, see. And then uh, you'd, you'd you'd eat your lunch, generally consisting of two giant salami sandwiches and uh, radishes. I brought radishes all the time. I used to. I didn't eat the radishes. I just threw them at people. And I I'd uh, I'm a great radish thrower. And uh, I'm the only guy you know who can throw a slider with a radish. They get that, they get that radish moving, man. And, uh, prepare a knuckler. You don't use your knuckle, you know, you throw a knuckler. It just tips your fingers. And, uh, but they, you know, these are all technical hits which had no, no importance to the story. And, and uh, after about, uh, 15 minutes after you've downed your salami sandwiches and your radishes and your four gallons of steel mill water and about a half a dozen, maybe 40 or 50 salt tablets, you can produce the most Window rattling, fantastic burp you ever heard in your life. It's a soul primal burp. It's the animal crying out for another animal. Blah, you know, it's like the Arabs. You know, the Arabs believe in this. I mean, I, I, I have, I have, you know, real affinity for Arabs. I spent one night in a Bedouin tent outside of Beersheba. Did you know that? Oh God, what I've done in my life when I think about it. And uh, we're sitting there eating sheep's eyes. And, uh, and, uh, curdled camel's milk. Yeah, it's actually what we're eating. In the, in the desert there. And, uh, I drew on my experience in the steel mills. After, after we finished the meal, you know, you're supposed to, it says, uh, the etiquette books call for a hearty belch. It says a hearty belch is the sign to your Arab host that you've enjoyed the meal. Well, he did not know that, uh, the Americano swine was capable of such talent. I blew the top of that tent right off. He did not know that uh, he was dealing with an ex steel worker who knew about that stuff. You know, just we used to have belching contests on the tin mill. You know, and, and uh, who could be heard the furthest? And you know how how we could tell? Guys would let one go, see, and you'd you know, bah, tremendous one, and you'd see heads rising up from various workbenches down there. People would look, and and uh, if you could get a guy to look up all the way down to the other end of the mill, you you know you you didn't have to pay for the chocolate milk that day when the milkman came around. <laughs> but it's all summer. Oh, you want to know what happened to the Toledo hotel room, right? You thought I was losing out on that. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I, uh, you know, some experiences that you have in life you don't necessarily want to share with others. Now, I'll tell you, though, that this, this night in the hotel room in Toledo, it's always, to me, is the epitome of, of hotness and summer. Uh, urban heat. We're, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely, uh, we're definitely very special. I mean, each, each, uh, person, uh, has lived his scene, and it makes him a specific thing. Now, like if, if, you know, you're sitting around in this tent with the Bedouins. I, I'm not kidding, I did do that. And, uh, you know, there's no way you can be a Bedouin. No way. Uh, let him go ahead and bet when all he wants. You know, he does his thing. Because uh, 14 million generations in the, ge in the desert have produced what he is. Yes. But 14 million generations of, of shepherds living in cheap hotels in Toledo have produced what I have. <laughs> Which makes me every bit as special as any Bedouin who ever lived. And I know the scene. I know the territory. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm perfectly at home in the White Castle. Yeah. I know just exactly how to squeeze that plastic tomato that has the ketchup in it, which would confuse the better when they did. I know just how much to put on my White Castle hamburger to give it that proper soup serve of, of uh, elegant piquancy. You know? <laughs> 
Then I'm, I'm, I'm lying in a sack this night saying, it's hot, oh God, it's hot. And it's 110, maybe, and maybe at least 110. I'm not kidding, not exaggerating. There's no state gets hotter than northern Ohio on the shore of Lake Erie with possibly Mojave Desert. And you can smell the dead fish out there and all the crud and detergent in Lake Erie. You hear the occasional distant muttering, muffled roar of a, of maybe a mugging going on somewhere down on Michigan Street. All, all the streets down there are named after lakes. There's Superior and Huron and Erie. And I'm on Huron Street in this cheap hotel. You ever lived in a cheap hotel for a whole summer? You get to know every sound. When all of a sudden I'm aware of something, I just feel a tension in the air. See, this is what makes you like a Bedouin. The Bedouin recognizes subtle signs which you are not aware of. Well, I recognize a subtle sign, which uh, the Bedouin, had he been in the hotel room there, would not have known. Immediately I recognize something's up. I'm lying in the heat there, and I'm finishing the last, I was, I was nursing the last maybe quarter inch of my, uh, my tepid orange drink. By the way, I always associate lukewarm orange drink with very hot summer weather. You have the same... So I'm sucking away at the orange drink scene. And I, it was just at that minute it happened. It was a fantastic moment. And I always remember this because of the heat and everything. The window of my room just crashed in. Just, bah! I jumped up. It was dark. It was, it was, and remember, I'm on the second floor. It's, it's dark, hot. And this window crashed in, and I see a figure run through the room dressed in what looked like shining black armor. He runs through the room, and another one comes through the window behind him. And then another one. And I'm just sitting in the bed, watching him run by. And they're towing through the window of my room a fire hose. And they just, they don't even say anything. They just run right through. Just right through the window. And right past me. And all three of them roar past, and there's a hose now over my bed. And I can, I can, I can smell the smoke. A big pall of smoke comes roaring in down through the, the hall and into my room. I'm just sitting there. Well, now, of course, at that point, this is, this is when the, when the real you comes out. Now, some people would leap up and scream and run around and hit their head against the wall, you know? You agree that there would be people who would do that. Then there's other people who uh, would just, uh, you know, pull the cork on their Jim Beam, take another swig, and turn over. I'm not one of those either. So I sit up in bed. I say to myself, well, the hotel's on fire. It's going to be tough on the cockroaches. <laughs> well, now at that time, I had many choices. Uh, but they were all just uh, separated by an infinite variety of, uh, of just tiny shadings. One choice remained paramount, get out, right? So I get up, and uh, I had no clothes with, uh, other that summer. I was, I was living very loose and light. I had, uh, I had uh, a dop kit. Remember, I, I said, well, I ought to save my dop kit. So I go into the bathroom... And I'm greeted with a, with a great roar of, of uh, smoke, flames, and the John. <laughs> My John, have you ever been burned out? Have you ever been in a hotel that's burned up? So I says, well, I better close the bathroom. I ought to get my uh, toothbrush. So I reached through the smoke. I could see my toothbrush on a little shelf, which was above the rusty sink. that would, It never really gave out water. It gave out small chunks of what looked like iodized Brillo pads. It would spit them out, you know. And I'd shave every morning with this stuff. And so I reach through the smoke and I take my toothbrush. Now, I might uh, tell you that I, I was uh, sleeping in a pair of jockey shorts. That's it, period. So I turn around, I go back in the room, and I uh, go to the closet. Well, the closet, ridiculous. They had this uh, plywood uh, box that was nailed to the wall, is what it was, with a broomstick over, you know, with a hanging, you hang stuff on. So I open my plywood, I says, now is my chance. It hit me. 
That's the kind of sick mind I've got. It just bothers me. I says, now's my chance to get rid of all this rotten clothing I never liked. You know, have, you ever, have you ever accumulated a lot of stuff you just basically hate? So I said, I'm just going to leave all this junk here to hell with them. So I, I, uh, I look in the closet. I take out my white shirt, the only white shirt that I had left, and I just take this, you know, it was a sleeveless white shirt. I just take it and I just plop it on, and I put on a pair of denim shorts and my Japanese shower clocks. And then I pulled the final coup. I went out the window that the firemen came in. And I followed their hose. I figured if I followed the hose, I'd get to where, you know, where, where, where the pay dirt was. You know, there's an old woodsman thing that says, follow the, uh, follow a stream and you will arrive at a river. Have you ever lost? You've heard that, Jerry? Follow a, a stream and, and uh, it'll arrive at a river. And if you follow the river downstream, you'll eventually arrive at, uh, Probably Topeka, Kansas, if you follow it far enough. So uh, I I, uh, <laughs> I did the same thing. If you ever caught in a fire, follow the hose. So I followed the fire hose, which went over the which went over a, a an adjoining roof. And I'm, everybody else is screaming and hollering and hanging on the windows. Shepherd's casually walking over the gravel covered roof of a building next to him, and uh, following the hose. It went down down the side of a building and into a into a uh, into a, like an alley. So I just take the hose and I just climb down the hose. I casually walk out and I join the crowd in front of the hotel watching the fire. And I says, what's going on here? Guy says, it's a fire. Well, see, I was not about to admit that I lived there because I was four weeks rent in arrears. You know? So the building burnt right down. And I just walked on down the street that night, and I registered in the YMCA. Had a happy ending. I never did pay that four weeks in arrears. And I got rid of that awful, lousy, Sears Roebuck, bad sports shirt that I had. It had bothered me for months. But that's heat. Summertime. And that night, I walked around, and I could see the flames of the hotel. I could see the fire. I could smell Lake Erie, and it was 107 degrees. I said to myself a couple of times, Shepard, you're alive. My God, this is great. You're really here. And heat and summer have always been sort of a kind of Freudian thing with me now. It always reminds me of that hot night in the Lorraine Hotel. Even the name has that certain Willie Loman quality to it, you know, the Lorraine Hotel. And by the way, their, their elegant dining room, was called the Joan of Arc coffee shop. I mean, you know, Joan of Lorraine, you know, the whole thing. You know, Joan of Arc. Kind of elegant. I like that, you know. It's, <laughs> it's all part of life. And you get so that you, you're, you're hung on it. You just can't give it up. And, uh, I just, yeah, you know, one of the greatest moments I ever spent in my life. You ever go, you ever go on a fish out? You know, right now, this, right this minute, mid July, in the middle of the August season, hot, the big channel cats are running in the Ohio River. Now, do you know what a channel cat is? A well, channel cat is a is a, is a is a catfish, but it's it's a it's a big, mean, tough, fighting catfish. One of the great fishes of America, incidentally, and they'll grow to maybe 60, 70 inches, 70 pounds. In fact, there have been catfish that have been on recording. I mean, I'm talking about channel cats that have been recorded that weighed over 200 pounds. Fantastic fish. And one night, I'm sitting, just sitting quietly in a, in a room on Vine Street in Cincinnati, and a guy calls up and says, hey, you want to go to a fish out tonight? I had not known what a fish out was. And I said, yeah, a fish out? He said, I'll pick you up. He says, wear your rottenest, oldest clothes. And so I went out into the night with him in this Chevy pickup truck and drove along the river. Cincinnati. You could smell that, that river and that heat. You could smell Kentucky. And we parked the pickup truck about one o'clock in the morning and walked down a gravel road on the side of the river, which was laying out there black as the ace of spades at night. We walked through woods, and then I could hear some sounds up ahead. And as we got through the woods, there was a crowd of men, just men, gathered on the riverbank 
great crowd of guys, all colors, black, green, old, young, just primitive man, had gathered to catch giant channel cats with throw lines, trot lines they throw out across the river, and at the end of the trot line is a big gallon jug, empty gallon jug that floats out there it's like a bobber. There's about 15 hooks hanging down into the water, deep down in the water, and at the end of each hook is this, is this big barbed hook, and on the barbed hook is a big piece of very ripe calf's liver. God, do those fish love it. About every half hour they'd put on these giant channel cats, and they're throwing them into big pots. They're boiling these fish. Tremendous channel cats. They're cutting them up, whacking them up into big fillets and just throwing them into big pots, big black pots. These guys are squatting in the darkness, eating channel cat. They don't know each other. They're just sitting there, all of them, hundreds of them gathered, eating channel cat. Temperature 110 degrees. And drinking Kentucky white lightning smoke. Have you ever had smoke? You know what smoke is? Smoke is what people know better as corn liquor. But there's a certain kind that's called smoke, and it has a smoky color to it. If you've ever lived in Kentucky, you know what that, that, that curious silver smoke quality is. And they're drinking it out of fruit jars and eating catfish and squatting down in their haunches at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. So I fell in with this thing. And all night we pulled catfish out of the river, guys I didn't know drinking smoke and then you'd lay down in the weeds and sleep a while and get up and eat some more catfish drink some more smoke and all the while this, the dawn is coming up over the river it kept on all the next day and half of the next night me and Watson are out at this fantastic fish out two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning eating channel cat drinking smoke and finally the whole weekend is gone this way we get back into the truck and drive into town, covered with stubble, smelling like like uh, wood ashes, fish guts, and smoke, and Kentucky corn whiskey, and swearing. Men get down in the river and use language that goes all the way back to Odd, the caveman. They speak in guttural monosyllables. Nobody uses word longer than uh, you know, grab a bottle and drink it. We go staggering into Bob's house. He was a married type, see, I was going to school. And his, his wife just looked at us. Her face was, was white. She says, don't come in my kitchen like that. We were suddenly back in civilization. Yeah, there's something deep in the marrow of the bones of males that the female will never understand. Never. No way. No way. I'm sorry, a Gloria Steinem. I'm sorry. It's the way it is. That night cookout on the Ohio River. The roaring flames in the Lorraine Hotel. And the smell of the quiet fermentation of Lake Erie. And the heat comes in over Hoboken on a quiet July night. The life force.